Well, I, I believe that the only way that America and the world will, will ever really find out what happened to us when we unleashed the hounds of hell and moved down this path of torture is through a truth commission. We have lost complete, almost total trust has been eroded from the institutions and the mechanisms that currently exist within American society to try to establish accountability. It's about us finding out what happened to us as a country. How did we allow ourselves as a nation, as a society, to move down this path? We haven't really addressed the issues. It is a problem that permeates every level of command, the entire hierarchy, from our executive branch, our congressional branch, to the Department of Defense, the military services, and all the way down to the young soldiers that were on the ground. Some cases, in fact, uh, applying the orders of higher headquarters to conduct some of these interrogations and some of this torture, and in a lot of cases, truly committing criminal acts, and all of that has come together and gotten mixed up and become conventional wisdom for America, and it will not be resolved until we can, in fact, have a truth commission that's objective. And until we can establish that, I don't believe we will ever get to the roots of what actually happened to us. So you're supporting a truth commission? Absolutely. Absolutely. I have no problems with that. And I, so in my view, in, as it, from a human rights perspective, it is really anathema in human rights law to be able to say that there are war crimes, there are crimes against humanity, which torture is, um, and to then say, in order for you to tell us what you did, which we already know, you just have to ask my clients, um, we will make sure that you will never, ever have to pay the price for this, but you just have to tell us what you did. Now, the truth part and the, the, the uh, transparency part is absolutely critically important. However, the most important piece is the accountability part. And it is... <laughs> and, and in order to make sure it never happens again, um, you can't pass a law because laws can get repealed. You can't put out executive orders because they get changed by the next president. You have to make these guys who would do this so afraid of going to jail that they would literally stop their ideas about torturing before you even knew about it. The point of this whole thing is if there was a credible fear for these people to go to jail, a credible fear, we might never have seen this. And what I don't want to see happen moving forward is that we half step on this issue um, just by getting the truth out there without the hammer. If you torture, if you, cr if you create uh, um, illegal activity on, against international law and domestic law, you will go to jail just like if you robbed a bank. And that's the piece that we need to get by pushing for criminal prosecution. You know, one of the questions we all have is, well, how do we face the world, you know, after eight years of George Bush? And it was looking pretty good there for a while. But now we have this question of what do we do with the people that have done the bad things that we already know? And I really um, don't, and I, and, I, and I agree with you, actually, that accountability is a much broader piece than just prosecution. I completely agree with that. And I don't think that prosecution and investigation are mutually exclusive at all. But I do think politically in this country, if you don't push for prosecution, prosecution, you won't get anything. Well, let, let me tell you why I... <laughs> well, hold on a second, hold on a second. One of the things that Vince was saying, which I think is very credible, having reported about prosecutions for years, is that anvil, you will be prosecuted. Well, what it does is it gets the rats running off that ship. We can't have so many laws violated to such grievous harm to so many people and say that was then, and let's move forward. It doesn't work that way. You never get to accountability. You never get to consequences. People go about their lives, and there, there are umpteen, 83,000 umpteen victims, many of them still now in prisons around the world, that are wildly unauthorized based on our standards, based on the treaties we've signed. And, and we're saying, sorry, too messy for me, too messy for my institutions, too messy for my systems or my notion of leadership. That's not going to cut it, not now, in terms of restoring America's moral energy, which is at the source, the key to us being able to protect ourselves going forward. Forget about, you know, sort of a constitutional law class debate. Unless we get moral energy back and fast, we are never, ever going to win the battles that we have to face right now, ever. That's the source of real power. 
It's not armies assembled on borders, with all due respects, General. It's moral power. That's what's always been the stuff that really transforms this wider world. Without that, we are absolutely at this moment looking at how soon, how soon the wages of this will come to. For me, it's a, it's a very simple objective. As a wartime commander and having led soldiers in battle three different times, it's about our young sons and daughters. The next time that America goes to war, I don't want a commander to be looking back at all of the crosses that line those grave, those cemeteries. And for me, it was 843 in Iraq and over 7,000 wounded. I don't want for that commander in the future to look back like I do today and realize that because America decided to leave the moral high ground, we sacrificed young men on the battlefield. That must never happen to America again. Whether it is the United States military, whether it is our intelligence community, whether it is the civilian control over the military, that is something that America is, is America's gift to the world, honestly, in this point in time and in civilization. Whatever we decide needs to be done to redress the wrongs that we've committed as a culture and as a country over the last eight years, those need to be things that make us whole again, that allow our institutions to function, or we need a revolution. Those are our only choices. <laughs> Um, I, I don't advocate the revolution. <laughs> <laughs> Neither do I. I was trying to make it look like a bad option. Uh, but, you know. That sounded kind of good. I, don't know. I, know. I, I still believe in civilian control. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if, if, those in, if those institutions are things that we believe were the right idea, yeah. then we need to fix this in a way that makes those things the means by which we move forward and they're something that we believe in again. We have laws against torture. That's why the Geneva Conventions prohibit cruel, inhumane, and degrading treatment, because they seem like they might work all the time in every new crisis and every civilization. There's a reason that we have laws against these things, not because that they seem useless, but because it always seems like they might work. That's why people always want to do them. It's not out of sadism and imagination that we always want to do this, that we know about the Spanish Inquisition, that we know about the rack, that we know about the waterboard, about all these things that have been done. It always seems like it might work. And so we have these rules that don't allow us to do it, that actually aren't at all contingent on whether or not it works. They're just off the table. You can't consider them. And the reason there has to be a law against them is because we understand through civilization, the history of civilizations, that we will be tempted to do those things.